Welcome everybody to the second in a series of seven talks plus one roundtable at the end. Uh, tonight's talk is by Professor Daniel Tagliarina, who earned his PhD from the University of Connecticut and teaches in the Department of Political Science at Utica College. His teaching and research focus on law in the United States with a special focus on the intersections of systems of power, privilege, and rights. He's co-authored a book with uh, Professor Corinne Tag Tagliarina uh, and the, re the title of which is Bringing Human Rights Back, Embracing Human Rights as a Mechanism for Addressing Gaps in United States Law. In this book, they discuss well-documented policy failures in the US and articulate how human rights approach can push for better policies that help to address the fa failures in these areas. His talk this evening is in parentheses, white American democracy, the challenges of democratic transitions within undemocratic institutions. And with that, I will hand over the floor and the mic to Dr. Tagliarina. Right. Well, thank you. I'll go ahead and fiddle. There we go. Uh, get this uh, started. Can everyone see the uh, PowerPoint? Yep. OK. So uh, as we said, the uh, title of the talk is White American Democracy. So what? I'm going to get at, and as the entire uh, series is responding to, is the insurrection on the Capitol on January 6th when Congress met to certify the Electoral College votes. And here are just a few of the images uh, we can see uh, coming from that uh, with the uh, again, Confederate flag being marched through our national capital, something that did not actually even happen during the actual Civil War, uh, and then various other bits of unrest. So to work through the talk, we're going to have uh, sort of three major topics uh, that I want to talk about. Uh, first is talk about democracy and get some terms out, make sure we're all on the same page with what it is we're talking about. Look at some of the undemocratic institutions that uh, are going to be important for the story. And then talk about the effect of those undemocratic institutions in a allegedly or supposedly or intentionally meant to be democratic country. And what that means then as we have tension around uh, handover of power and democratic transitions. So looking at democracy then, uh, again, important to get some uh, basic terms out there. Democracy can be defined in a bunch of different ways, mean different things. But when you get right down to it, what we are talking about is a system of rule that permits citizens to play a significant part in the governmental process, uh, usually through selection of key public officials. So we're not talking about direct democracy or anything like that, where it has to be everyone making every decision. It can be representative or in other forms. But importantly, people are meant to be front and center and people are supposed to have an active role in the government. Relatedly is the idea of popular sovereignty. This is the basic core principle that in a democratic uh, society or a democratic government, the people are the source of authority and power. So we see this in a lot of the complaints. Uh, Robert last talk mentioned the Declaration of Independence and the appoints against the king. And part of what we framed as the reasons why we had to split away from uh, Great Britain was to get at this notion that we absolutely as the people have the right to rule and make our own decisions. Also core to democracy is an idea of political equality that each person gets equal weight and should have an equal say or at least have their voice heard uh, and an equal merit. And this brings us then to the broader concept of liberal democracy, again, a representative government built on the ideas of popular sovereignty, liberty, and political equality. So when I talk about democracy throughout this talk, this is really what I'm talking about, is living in a liberal democracy. And I know liberal has lots of other connotations in American political context. You can forget about that. We're talking about sort of grand liberalism with liberty at its root. So this has not partisan connotations, uh, but more theoretical there. So important also to understand beyond this is that when it comes to putting those ideas into practice in a democratic government, they're really at the core. We have these three important concepts. Uh, one is loser's consent, one is legitimate opposition, and the other being a peaceful transition of power. So when we talk about loser's consent, it is important to any sort of democracy that 
the electoral losers, those who do not win elections, acknowledge that elections are the process by which these uh, decisions are made. And losing doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the system. So it's important in any democracy that when someone loses, they acknowledge that loss and do not question the system to go against the, the idea that people decide is to go against the very fundamental idea or concept of a democracy in general. So all of this is going to be really important because you can't maintain a democratic system if the people who are out of power or who lose power refuse to give it up or uh, question the integrity or legitimacy of the system in general. So all of that is important. And underlying all of this is in a democratic system that being a loser in one electoral cycle doesn't mean you will always be uh, the loser uh, moving forward and that parties can change. And we've actually just seen that in this last election uh, where control of the government has shifted. So second then is this idea of legitimate opposition. Uh, democracy, especially a modern democracy based in parties, requires that when one party is governing, the others, and could be others if it's a multi-party system or just one other uh, if it's a dual party system like the United States, the other is meant to offer alternatives. They are meant to push and challenge and question uh, what is happening, but not the legitimacy of the system itself. Uh, so in the idea of a party system, uh, Richard Hofstadter had defined legitimate democratic opposition as being responsible, effective, constitutional opposition. So it needs to be answerable to the people, it needs to be answerable to the people in power and their uh, constituents, it needs to be effective, meaning alternatives that are being offered need to be legitimate, they need to be things that can actually happen, things that are realistic, and constitutional opposition means it needs to be rooted in the system that we have to make sure that it is playing by the same rules as everyone else. So what this means then is that the opposition parties, those who are not controlling powers or not in the majority, uh, can question policies and priorities, not the legitimacy of the government. And uh, the flip side of this is that the party in power is not supposed to question the legitimacy of the opposition. It's having a party out of power say, we don't agree with your priorities or we're not sure about this policy isn't the same as saying, we don't think you should exist or you are attacking our fundamental uh, way of life or any of these other things that are uh, much more inflammatory and potentially uh, dangerous as far as uh, maintaining a democracy is concerned. So this last element is the peaceful transition of power. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, but what we're talking about is handing over power from one set of leaders to the next. And it could be within a party, but when this really becomes important is when power is handed from one party or one group of people to another. This idea of, again, of the legitimate opposition coming back here is that allowing the transition to happen means playing by the rules, acknowledging a defeat when it happens, uh, and moving on because in a democracy, free and fair elections produce legitimate winners. Uh, without peaceful transitions or without uh, accepting these principles, uh, we get into the place of questioning or fully undermining democracy in and of itself. Uh, so what we see then is there's process outlined in the Constitution that's meant to be followed uh, and then further specified in specific election laws, and that's really what we're talking about. And what we get then with the, these ideas of loser's consent, legitimate opposition, and a peaceful transition of power is the core of how democracies move forward, and failure to acknowledge any or all of these jeopardizes a democratic system in general. So this is the system we are supposed to have. These are the rules that democracies are supposed to play by. And part of what we saw on January 6 was definitely undermining all of these principles, which we will get to. Uh, but as we get there, it is important that we stop. And as we were reminded during the last talk, that our constitution begins, we the people. And in this, we embrace this idea of popular sovereignty and government by the people. And it's important that we keep that front and center as we think through everything else. Because even as our constitution sets up the basis of our democracy and the attempts or aspirational goals of meeting these various democratic principles, the other thing we see 
is that our constitution and our democracy uh, from its root moving forward has a series uh, of undemocratic institutions built into it as well, which then creates these tensions between the democratic principles and ideals that uh, we claim to want to aspire to and try to aspire to and how things are actually done. So although there's several that are really worth highlighting, uh, I'm primarily going to focus on the Senate and the Electoral College. But as we get there, we do need to talk about Congress a little more generally because this helps sort of uh, explain part of how we get where we are. So as part of the various compromises that went into the Constitution, we ended up with a bicameral Congress split into a House of Representatives and a Senate. The House, however, itself involves various compromises, it is the one meant to represent the people and be based on population. But one of the biggest issues facing the country at the time of the Constitution was the question of slavery, how this would affect governance uh, and who even counts. And the compromise that was reached is rather than counting every slave uh, for population or counting none of the slaves was this agreement that uh, three fifths. So for every five slaves would count as three people. Uh, and again, the house would be voted for directly by the people. This is in opposition to the Senate where every state is meant to be treated equally. And importantly, in its original setup, the Senate was picked by state legislatures. So we did not pick our senators. So here we already see some tensions between the House and the Senate itself. And we start to get the root of some of the additional uh, democratic elements when we look at things like the Three-Fifths Compromise. Uh, the Three-Fifths Compromise being one of three places where without ever using the slavery, the institution or the word slavery, the institution of slavery was written into the Constitution. Uh, the other two being the prohibition on Congress's ability to stop or pass any legislation about the slave trade for 20 years, and the other being the Fugitive Slave Clause. And when we get to the Electoral College, we'll see the fact that we don't even pick our president also creates one of these um, challenges in terms of undemocratic institutions. Again, so a little bit about the House uh, and how it factors in here is one of the things produced by the Three-Fifths Compromise is that even as the House was meant to represent the people, it is, in fact, not equally representing the people that were even given uh, equal rights or, uh, or equal consideration or part of the system. Because what happens is the House is ultimately over representing slave states by counting slaves who legally were property and not human beings, according to the law. Uh, so they were given no rights uh, or any sort of protections whatsoever. And yet they did count towards the census boosting representation of slave holding states uh, based on the three-fifths compromise. And because the electoral college uh, electors are set up based on representation in Congress, over-representing slave, uh, slave holding states in the House means also over-representing them in the electoral college. But despite these uh, words or concerns about the House, it's worth emphasizing that in the original federal constitution uh, created uh, and ratified in 1788, written in 1787, ratified in 88, is the fact that at the federal level, it is only the House of Representatives that were picked by the people. Uh, that asterisk there is the fact that not universally, but basically white property owning males were the only people allowed to vote at this time. Uh, there are a few states that allowed uh, free black people to vote, uh, but they quickly took that right away. So even in the limited context, uh, it's important that we acknowledge that the federal government only saw anything resembling democracy in the House of Representatives. Uh, and the Senate was never meant to be democratic because it represents states and not people underlying this belief that there's something about states that create interests that are somehow separate from the individual interests or aggregate interests of the people within that state. So the Senate was not meant to be a democratic institution. And uh, as I pointed out earlier, and as it says here, we didn't even pick our own senators until the 17th Amendment was ratified in 1913. So it's only been a little over 100 years that we've been picking our own senators, which was part of later attempts at democratic reform to make the government more responsive and more lowercase d democratic. <laughs> 
Uh, but the other thing we need to talk about is that the malapportionment of the Senate has gotten worse. Uh, the imbalance of the size of population of the states has grown over time. Uh, and we see this uh, in a couple uh, shocking statistics, I guess, uh, for people who haven't stopped to consider uh, these things before, that over half of the US population lives in nine states. Uh, and we're also rapidly approaching the point where it's going to be eight states that have uh, over half of the US population. Because each state gets two senators, those nine states with more than half of the country's population get 18 senators. And the minority of the US population that live in those other states end up with 82 senators, which speaks a little bit to the imbalance. Uh, we also see in the fact that California, our most populous state, is larger than the smallest 21 states combined. It's also worth pointing out, um, unless things have drastically changed, uh, we'll know a little more when the census is done, uh, New York is the fourth largest state and it's about half the size of California. So people are not evenly distributed across the country. Uh, the Senate represents states and not people, creating these various uh, imbalances uh, that uh, continue and go on. And again, if we're gonna look at that, California, California gets two senators. Each of those 21 states that collectively make up not quite California, uh, get uh, 21 times the representation. So how does this happen? Well, if we look at how we got additional states after the first 13, it becomes informative. Uh, first, and leading up to the Civil War, although there were different rules sort of governing it, the Congress was pretty careful to try to balance slave and non-slave holding states when states were admitted. First, under the Missouri Compromise, it just artificially picked the line on the map and said, North, any new state will be free. Any new state south of that will be slave holding. This is later placed by the Kansas-Nebraska Act where states were allowed to determine it. But because Congress ultimately had the final say, they tried to balance when slave and non-slave holding states were there to keep the Senate itself balanced. So states were created or admitted or accepted, call it what you will, in a way intentionally meant to preserve the balance between slave and non-slave, which actually fits with how James Madison talked about much of the Constitution, because as much as we love to talk about it as being compromises or disagreements or whatever between large states and small states, Madison in his notes on the Constitutional Convention actually described the important compromises between North and South, those that owned slaves and those that did not. Which is not to say that Northern states didn't engage in it, but that's not exactly how he put it. So things change a bit when we get to the Civil War uh, when it comes to admitting states. And what we see is that the newly created Republican Party that comes to power uh, with the election of Lincoln, moving forward through the Civil War and Reconstruction uh, and much of the end of the 19th century, intentionally added large, sparsely populated states that had Republican-leaning uh, constituencies uh, or people to make sure that the Senate would remain in Republican control. And this is what we see at this table. So if we go from 1863 to 1890, going from West Virginia all the way down to Wyoming, looking at this, you can see, uh, and I'll put it to that uh, representation ratio column a moment, uh, that's basically based on existing uh, formula at the time for representatives in the House, how many representatives those states would have. So when West Virginia breaks off from Virginia, it would have about three House districts. Uh, importantly, 1864 gives us Nevada that had about one tenth of a, the population of one House district. Uh, it wasn't until about 1970 that they actually had enough of a population in the state that under the original admittance criteria, they would have qualified for a single representative in the House of Representatives. And as we see, many of these states don't have all that many people. They're much smaller than a single congressional district, and yet they were admitted, uh, especially um, in the wake of uh, Reconstruction and then moving forward uh, into the Jim Crow era, that it was meant to keep Republican control of the Senate because the other thing that happens is with the 14th Amendment getting rid of the three-fifths compromise, suddenly Southern states now have a lot more population because the former slaves now count as full people. 
And once Jim Crow rolls around, they are disenfranchised left and right. And the South is now even further overrepresented through the process of disenfranchising uh, Black Americans. So when we look at the Senate now, we see a lot of the same things. Uh, political scientists have been studying this for a long time. And it turns out that the Senate, unsurprisingly, based on what we just learned about sort of the setup and the history and the intent, privileges smaller, whiter states. Uh, this equal representation would mean that small states are overrepresented. And it turns out our small states tend to be whiter than the national average. But this also means that it has the effect of depressing voting power of racial minorities. Political scientists uh, have ways of calculating these things and without getting too deep into that, compared to an average white American, black Americans have about 75% of the voting power. Your average Asian American has 72% of the voting power of an average white American and your Latinx Americans have 55% of the voting power because of the way the Senate overrepresents whiter states. This also now, because of the way the parties have sorted themselves in the electorate, has led to what is currently a Republican advantage in the Senate, in part done through what a previous version of the Republican Party had done. And we can see this in one uh, sort of clear and shocking statistic across the elections in 2014, 2016, and 2018. And because of the weird way we do Senate elections, that's every single seat in the Senate. Nationally speaking, Democrats won 8% of the vote more on average in each of those elections and remained a minority party in the Senate across all three of those elections. So we see that this imbalance then is also starting to become a partisan uh, imbalance as well, even if that was never actually the intent. So as we turn to the Electoral College, a lot of those problems that we talked about with the House and the Senate are going to be magnified because it is based on representation with the House and the Senate. And as far as undemocratic institutions go, you don't have to go much farther than states get to pick some people who get to pick the president and you have no say in it. Uh, it's a little better now uh, than it was in part uh, with the Supreme Court ruling that states can in fact force or at least punish electors who do not vote the way they are supposed to. But this means that we only indirectly elect our president, making the president itself a not particularly democratic institution, even as the president is the only one that we nominally all as a country get to vote for. Uh, when we look back to the Constitutional Convention, uh, the delegates there had already settled on the three-fifths compromise before coming up with the Electoral College. And part of the reason for creating the Electoral College, there's the off-sighted, it's because there was the belief that people in states wouldn't know who would be a good president uh, if they, those other people come from other states because most people didn't leave their state. There's some truth to that. But there's also a lot of truth to the fact that it was in fact meant to continue the uh, slave advantage that the slaveholding states got by linking it after the Three-Fifths Compromise to representation in Congress. We see this malapportionment of representation continues forward. And we see this then from 1790 through 1860, that about 6% of the Electoral College is directly attributable to the number of enslaved people living in states giving then a uh, what's called a slavery bonus to those states that enslave more people. Uh, this changes with the ratification of the 14th Amendment, but it's worth pointing out that until we got the 14th Amendment, every single winning presidential ticket had one or two Southerners on it, the one exception being the 1860 election of Lincoln, and even that got changed for his second election. So we also see uh, just some quick numbers here to talk about exactly how this uh, works. Don't need to get too much into it, but it's worth pointing out that Virginia at the time of the 1790 census was the largest state and PA was the second largest. They had roughly the same free white population, but Virginia got 21 electors to PA's 15. Similarly, South Carolina and New Hampshire had effectively the same free white male population, but South Carolina got two extra electors based on enslaved people. So this is a sort of um, slave bonus as it was referred to on the other slide that we're talking about. So how does it function now? Well, it turns out uh, William Blake, who's a political scientist, uh, published a study somewhat recently that 
looked into how the electoral college functions now and it turns out the electoral college privileges wider more racially resentful states and we'll talk about uh, what that means moving forward but focusing on the wider if remember from the senate the senate privileges smaller wider states and some of those states have very few people uh, what this means, and here's an example looking at North Dakota. North Dakota is our seventh whitest state. It is 47th in rank of population. But uh, when you look at how many electoral college votes per million adult residents, they have 5.2 when the national average is 2.2. Uh, I cut the slide, but I'll go ahead and throw this out there. Uh, it's also worth pointing out if you take just Manhattan, not even all of New York City, but just Manhattan, and you split it into a northern and southern Manhattan, uh, northern Manhattan will have slightly larger population than North Dakota, and southern Manhattan will have a slightly larger population than South Dakota. So again, these population imbalances come back in many ways. So this means smaller, whiter states have more say when it comes to electing presidents. Uh, and based on the math done in the study, about 10% higher uh, than the average whiter population will lead to one extra electoral college vote. So the other part of his study uh, looked at uh, states uh, racial resentment. There's a series of questions that are well accepted in uh, psychology that are used a bunch uh, to measure racial resentment. Uh, and when states through representative samples are given these uh, sets of questions, the states that score higher on the racial resentment have more electoral college votes than states of comparable size, uh, which ends up having a very real electoral impact across US history, not just in recent elections. And we see again and again, the way this uh, turns out on uh, place forward, but primarily what it allows for is minority governance by a racially dominant group. So white people can uh, maintain power, hence the white American democracy in the title, in ways that are disproportionate to the actual representation in the population. So to quote one more political scientist, uh, George C. Edwards wrote, the Electoral College thus discourages attention to the interest of African Americans because they are unlikely to shift the outcome in a state as a whole. So the ultimate effect here is as the Senate and therefore the Electoral College continue to privilege the votes of white Americans and whiter states, we come back to this place where minority uh, racial interests are often overlooked for a sort of dominant electoral strategy that focuses on white and in particular Southern white interests. So what does this mean then when it comes to democratic transitions? Well, the first one we're gonna look at, it's a little more indirect, but it starts to lay the groundwork uh, for what's happening because we had our first real democratic transition, something that is now commonplace looking at uh, Obama and Trump in 2016 and then some shots from uh, the past few weeks here. But our first real democratic transition comes in 1800. So we could look at any of these points, uh, 1800, 1824, 1860, 1876, and then 2016 and 2020 are all uh, illuminating in different reasons. We're going to sadly skip over 1824 and 1860 for time, but there's very much to be said there. Uh, and even 1876, I will do a sort of cursory look because uh, Professor Harris, I think he's giving the next talk. Uh, yeah, so Professor Harris will be giving the next talk. We'll focus more on 1876, which there's so much to be said there. But the first transition really comes in 1800, as we have our president and vice president at the time pictured here, John Adams on our left, Thomas Jefferson on our right. Uh, and what was an incredibly contentious election, in part because the Federalists, who were growing increasingly unpopular, had passed a series of laws uh, that collectively became known as the Alien and Sedition Acts that did a whole lot of things, including eliminating immigration. But a lot of it had to do with crackdowns on individual liberties and attacks on the government and a lot of other things, leading to the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, and not only to be formed and start to take shape as political parties, but also to very much frame this election as one about the soul of the nation, where both sides believe the other uh, success or victory would be the end of America. 
So John Adams uh, is the sitting president at this point and is increasingly unpopular. And the Electoral College at this point does the thing that's a little bit different than now because we change it after this election is that all of the electors cast two votes. They have to be for different people. One of them has to not be from the state as the electors are in. But it means if you're trying to create parties to navigate the system, what you do is you tell all of the electors who are people from your party to vote for the person they want to be the president and the person you want to be vice president, except this would produce a tie, which would be a problem, which is why the Federalists figured out what you need to do is have of the Federalist electors, which ended up being 65, uh, 65 of them voted for John Adams and 64 of them voted for who was supposed to be his uh, running name, uh, which is Pickney. And one of them voted for John Jay, meaning we would have had a president and a vice president, except the uh, Democratic Republicans were far more popular in this election. And their 73 electors voted for Jefferson and 73 of them voted for Aaron Burr which creates some issues here because suddenly now even though everyone both in the party and not knew that jefferson was meant to be the next president and aaron burr was meant to be his vice president in this because one of the electors and it turns out it was an elector from new york failed to vote for somebody else there was a tie and under ties in the electoral college the house of representatives gets to decide and because of a quirk of how we did everything at this point the house of representatives was controlled in a lame duck session by the federalists who were about to be out of power which meant they had to come together and vote and it ends up taking them because of the other curiosity is that even though the house is by population each state gets one vote when it comes to picking the president it takes them 36 ballots across seven days to eventually just decide that jefferson in fact should be the next president uh any of you who've listened to or watched hamilton at this point know all of this story fairly well although hamilton's role and it's a little bit overblown eventually the the, the decision is made and aaron burr is going to eventually shoot and kill Alexander Hamilton. But despite that part of it, what we have here is the House eventually makes its decision. Adams leaves the White House uh, when his time comes. Jefferson comes in. Jefferson gives a speech where he declares that we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans, speaks a lot about unity, something we're hearing more and more about right now. And the country moves on and everything's great. Except that's not exactly the whole story uh, or the important parts. But as far as democratic transitions go, this is incredibly important because we have handover from one party to the other. What this story doesn't tell us is that while it's peaceful, it's far from uh, friendly to say the least, because the Federalists in Congress also spent their time as they're losing the presidency in Congress, packing the courts. They created more judgeships, they put more judges in there, they decreased the size of the Supreme Court so that when someone retires, Jefferson could not replace him. And they did all of this because they fully believed that Jefferson was going to destroy America. This led to increasing tensions uh, moving forward, uh, including then our first federal impeachment uh, as the Jeffersonians in Congress target a federal judge known to be drunk and possibly insane. And after that, they then targeted the man who's now on the right, which is uh, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase. Samuel Chase was an outspoken Federalist put on the court by Washington, um, who referred to uh, Jeffersonians as creating a mobocracy. Uh, he also said they're all a bunch of atheists who shan't, can't be trusted with anything. And for his off-bench remarks, and a little bit for some of the stuff he did on the court, the uh, allies of Jefferson in the House of Representatives voted to impeach him. There is a, uh, this is 1803, they vote to impeach. The trial moves into 1804, which also is running up against Marbury versus Madison at the same period of time. So all of this is part of this transition, which it turns out is a little less democratic than we thought. And importantly, Jefferson's party had the votes in the Senate to remove Samuel Chase. But upon the trial, they decided that this was not a good use of their power, and they actually put country uh, before party. They chose not to remove Samuel Chase, and we move forward from here. So the Senate then, even in its undemocratic position, and this is where we come back to it, decided to 
do what they thought was right and I'll protect the judiciary and the independence of the judiciary, which matters and allows for peaceful transitions moving forward up until 1860, which I said I wasn't talking about and I'm not going to, but it is worth pointing out that instead of questioning the legitimacy of the election or whether Abraham Lincoln was president, states said he's president, but we're still leaving anyway. So different sort of transition. Uh, but when we jump to 1876, we get another incredibly contentious election here between Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden. That again comes down to the Electoral College. This time, Samuel Tilden, uh, the man on the right, who's the Democratic candidate, uh, he's from New York, ends up with 185 electoral, sorry, 184 electoral college votes, one shy of the 185 that he needs to become president outright. Uh, this puts Hayes at 165, and there are 20 electors that are just up, up in the air. They're up in the air because Oregon picked one person to be elector who is ineligible, and three other states, accounting for the other 19 votes, sent two slates of electors. Each party sent their own saying, no, no, we won the state, which is confusing uh, and doesn't really tell us who should be there, which meant Congress had to get a commission together to try to figure out what to do with these electors. Do they have to pick? What's going on? And ultimately what happens, uh, and the main thing I'm gonna focus on in talking about 1876 is what's known as the Compromise of 1877. So before we get to the specifics of the compromise, what paved the way for it is that when he was accepting the Republican nomination, Hayes had pledged to bring the blessings of honest and capable local self-government to the South if he were elected. Uh, this was generally understood at the time to be code for ending Reconstruction. Reconstruction was the military occupation of the former Confederacy to bring them back fully into the Union and protect the now freed slaves. This is growing increasingly popular with many people. Hayes, as a Republican, had said, eh, I might be on your side if you vote for me. So as the congressional committee is figuring out what to do with the Electoral College votes, there's some backdoor dealing that leads to effectively uh, Hayes uh, and his representatives say that if you pick him, he will see control of the South back to the democratic governance there. And he will even put a Southerner in his cabinet. In response, the Democrats had promised not to dispute Hayes's election, and they agreed they would protect the civil rights of black citizens in their states. This moves forward. Those 20 disputed electors are all given to Hayes, giving him just enough through the Electoral College to become the next president. After inauguration, Hayes pulls troops out of Louisiana and South Carolina. Uh, and this is the beginning of the end for Reconstruction. And true to their word, just kidding. Southern Democrats didn't actually live up to their, their um, agreement at all. They uh, quickly reversed the Reconstruction policies. They made steps to disenfranchise Black voters who now count as full human beings for census purposes, further over-representing the Southern states in the House of Representatives, and they moved to impose Jim Crow laws to make sure that the now free Black Americans have no meaningful say in any sort of electoral politics. So this is ultimately what happens here and it works and the country is able to have a peaceful transition of power because the white interest in the Republicans and the white interest in the Democrats ultimately decide that moving the country forward is more important than protecting black Americans. Ultimately the effect of the compromise of 1877 is to set back uh, the equal rights aspect of democracy uh, for decades upon decades. But, you know, it was peaceful. So focusing only on peaceful transitions without justice becomes a bit problematic. So now we jump to 2016. Having looked at what some of these transitions look like and how we've avoided uh, more violent transitions, we see that there's still inherently problems but these problems were foreseen, could have been foreseen, all of the above, uh, by people paying attention. So it's, I'm going to say starts, certainly not the starting point, but for me, I'm going to start here with the chance of locker up. Going against the idea of legitimate opposition, Trump and his supporters specifically say they will arrest 
a political opponent, Hillary Clinton, uh, at the convention, elsewhere many other times. We also see it uh, with the one on the right and the top one on the left that back in 2016, before the election, Trump said the election was rigged. If he loses, uh, the only way he could possibly lose is if there was fraud in the election and he would not agree to accept the election results if he lost. We see in the one in the bottom left that he also falsely claimed after winning the election that millions of people voted illegally, and that's the only reason he lost the popular vote. So even in winning, he continues to, without any evidence, claim fraud in our system. But because he won, these moments where there is clear lack of acceptance of democratic institutions, democratic norms, uh, were, let were able to slide. So we see looking at some data from October 20th to the 25th and 2016, so right before the 2016 election, voters absolutely thought that Trump did not support democratic institutions. 56% uh, percent of people saying that President Trump, or I guess a candidate at that time, Trump, did not support democracy. But what starts to come clear is that there's a partisan split between the importance of this, including now a partisan way in which support for democracy and a loser's consent becomes important, where only 48% of Trump supporters said it's important that a loser will acknowledge the legitimacy of a winner's election. We also see that voters did not think that Donald Trump supported um, respected for or saw as equal, one of those core democratic values, a variety of different groups. So difference uh, is also in trust in elections and voters. Uh, so importantly, we see how it breaks down. People thought their vote would count, but thought that nationally there would be some issues. And the really interesting numbers are on the right. What we see is that in August of 2016, Trump voters absolutely thought the vote would be unfair. After Trump wins, they thought it was fine. Interestingly enough, uh, Clinton supporters basically stayed the same uh, from August to November, so before and after the election. Their belief in uh, the democracy and that votes were ac accurately counted stayed the same. So we see now that there are partisan splits that are starting to come from these undemocratic institutions where changes that have happened have now sorted themselves in a way where trust or support for democracy is becoming a partisan issue. Unsurprisingly, 2020 gives us a redux. Uh, the lead up to the election, Trump repeats many of the same things and a lot of the same fear seems to be there. Before the election even happens, uh, the president is claiming fraud. And if he loses, it is only because of fraud. This time he did lose. But what we see here, uh, looking at some numbers again, is that Trump voters uh, on the left side very much said they more or less assume that illegal votes will be counted, and that's a huge problem. And this looks at 2018 and 2020 elections, uh, both from October, so the lead up to both of those. There is not a lot of trust that the election will be run well uh, or votes will be counted uh, correctly. And there's partisan splits on this. What we see then is that while uh, Trump supporters or Republicans in this case thought that their vote personally would be counted, they expected national issues, uh, which we see here uh, quite remarkably uh, in that top number, only 21% of Trump voters said they were either very or somewhat confident about how the elections would be run. So we're getting these partisan differences. Uh, stoked by Trump and other uh, elected officials uh, who claimed fraud in advance and fraud after the fact. Uh, this includes over 60 court challenges filed by directly by Trump's campaign or by um, close affiliates. Uh, almost all of them, they end up losing in courts, usually with judges excoriating them for bringing uh, fallacious claims. So this leads us then to issues where now we have a group of people uh, who have become used to winning with fewer votes, as we saw with the Senate elections, uh, and they expected fraud in the system. There's less of an emphasis on core democratic values. 
and they've been benefiting from undemocratic institutions, all of which feeds into what happens on January 6th. And a lot of this is then seen in the president's own remarks as he went down and talked to the protesters in advance for over 70 minutes. I've got a handful of quotes. We don't need to read all of them because that would be too much and too long. But we see uh, claims of a stolen election claims that they're not going to give up and not going to concede because left was involved, uh, that we have to be worried about the country being destroyed, and that we did not have free and fair elections. It tells them that you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength, and you have to be strong. Calls Biden an illegitimate president, and specifically says Republicans have to get tough. We and interest of protecting our country because you can't have a vote based on fraud when you catch somebody in a fraud you're allowed to go be uh, you're allowed to go by very different rules so even the rules do not need to be followed and you have to fight like hell all of which signaled to the supporters that violence or other means and we know because the supporters themselves said this is what they took away from his message are acceptable so this leaves us then in trying to understand what happened on January 6th with this longer history, knowing that we have undemocratic institutions, that these undemocratic institutions privilege white Americans specifically and in particularly living in smaller states. And in the past, as well as now, they create tensions and problems for democratic transitions because democratic transitions require faith and democracy. They require trust in institutions, and they require trust in other citizens. All of these things, and particularly over the last four years, uh, have, with increasing, albeit asymmetric polarization, have continued to become more and more problematic and harder to find. And these are all at a low right now, so this spurs on partisan fighting in the Senate, including what happened shortly before this talk began, uh, where Mitch McConnell is currently threatening to filibuster the organizing uh, legislation, which is what would hand over control of the Senate from the Republicans to the Democrats. It's normally fairly pro forma and agreed upon, and even within the Senate itself, we have issues of problematic natures around transitions of power. So these undemocratic institutions are currently also partisan institutions, thanks to the way the parties have uh, sorted themselves, which means that we've got problems when it comes to peacefully handing over power. And in fact, it's hard to look at what happened on the 6th and say that it has, in fact, been a peaceful transition. What we need then is to rebuild faith in institutions, facts, and in one another because democratic institutions require that we believe in free and fair elections, that we can all agree as to what is actually happening, and that even when we disagree that we can actually support one another. We're never going to get there, however, if we allow people to attack those fundamental democratic principles that are important for allowing us to continue to move forward. And this is where we have a chance because democracy isn't just abstract principles. Dem democracy isn't just principles of governance. As the constitution says, it is we the people, we are our own democracy. So we have a chance to engage in what is often referred to as national myth-making. The series of talks itself is this is not who we are. This opens up a possibility for us to take what happened on the 6th, but more importantly, take what happened on the 20th, yesterday, where there was a peaceful handing over of power. And while the whole transition hasn't been peaceful, it happened. The transition happened, there were no major incidences, and we have a chance to define who we are. And importantly, that we, which has historically been so hard and has led to things like 1876, need to be avoided. We cannot narrowly define we, but we can open up and give chance to people who believe in democracy as our way forward. So we can reclaim transition as a democratic transition and hold accountable those who fomented the attacks on the 6th. And that is my talk. So thank you, everybody.
Yeah. Microphone down. Thank you, Dan. That was really great. Um, reminded me of all of my US history. Um, we are open for questions. Um, just as a heads up, um, jumping back and forth between questions on Facebook and Zoom. Uh, people, some people are submitting questions. If, if you're on Zoom, please speak your question so I don't have to read it for you, um, unless you just don't want to speak, and I'll, then I will read it, because um, I do need to read the Facebook questions. So I, mean, I have to, and I've got to shift between screens because we've got a lot of people here. So there are a lot of people. Yeah, there are. There are right now about 85 people here. So oh, it looks like Peter the Peter, as in not Peter de Simone, has a question. He has his hand up. So please unmute and ask away. Um, yeah. So my question uh, kind of focused on current efforts to build democracy into undemocratic um, institutions that you discussed, like the Senate specifically. There has been for the most part, partisan talk on the side of the Democrats for a few election cycles now, but it's it's once again kind of found its way into headlines, uh, admitting um, the District of Columbia in as a state and by extension potentially Puerto Rico in as a state, which would add probably four Democratic senators to the Senate, which could shift the balance of power, which currently overrepresents Republicans towards Democrats. Is that because there's already some momentum there, you see that as a, as an actual potential short-term solution to an imbalance in partisan power? Or is that, since it's not really building in more democracy, it's more just taking people who've been totally disenfranchised and giving them the indirect form of franchisement, kind of a, a half measure towards um, a, a building in democracy to undemocratic means? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, obviously, the Democrats have Democrats, capital D, now we're talking about the party, have a lot of uh, partisan motives for doing that. Uh, the, the voters, it's a little less clear in Puerto Rico, but definitely in DC, overwhelmingly vote Democratic. Uh, so it can serve their interest by doing it. But I do think there is also a small d Democratic argument to, to be made here, because you have people who have no representation or limited representation. Uh, they're not given the same say as others. And if we want to do the simple fact that there are more people in DC than in several states, there are more people in Puerto Rico than even more states, that if we really mean we are a democracy and we are the people, to rule over places that have no say at the federal level is inherently anti-democratic. So I think we should absolutely uh, include these places, uh, but because of the partisan interest and because it would affect the partisan balance in the Senate, uh, it's always going to be seen through a partisan lens as well. Anybody? Another, thank you for that answer. Anyone else? Yes, Bryce. All right, so... I just have a question. What would you say to the people of currently American citizens who don't necessarily believe that a government or democracy oriented government is, would be our way forward to people who are so jaded by what they've seen out of the more partisan government more recently and what they see on social media, which is obviously a factor in partisanship. What would you say to those Americans to get them to believe, more believe in the current and the American democracy and back into the, I guess, American constitution and our traditional values. Yeah. I mean, this is the ultimate challenge. Uh, there's, there's no simple answer. Uh, if there were a simple answer, I would hope we would have tried it by now. Uh, but it's a great question because how do you get people to support democracy is like the essence of people in political science who actually you know care about such things, which is most, but I'm, will say not all political scientists, that it becomes important to figure out how to get there. And I think a lot of it really does have to come down to points that we heard both in the talk last time, as well as in some of the questions. And it's in respecting the value of all people, respecting in the voice of all people who are willing to engage and finding out 
where we can find the commonality. And this is where starting local would be really important. It's one of, one of the things uh, that's really weird, and this is gonna seem like a little bit of a tangent, but I'm gonna bring it back, is that we've got really good data that when local news goes away, when local papers are bought up or closed down, when local news stations are replaced with uh, national ones, partisanship and polarization go up. And it turns out that national news is much more polarizing. Most people don't care about national news. Most people don't follow national news. But when it replaces the local news that they actually care about, we see more divisions and commonalities. So finding ways to bring back important local voices, finding ways to reach out and talk to people, and finding ways to embrace the importance of, I'll say directly, humanities-based education, where we really understand the importance of other people's voices and learn how to respectfully disagree with people we can get to places where those important democratic uh, values can be embraced. However, if you say all people have a valid voice and should be included and someone says, no, they shouldn't, it's unclear what you do. I mean, you can talk to them, you can continue to try to reach out to them, but at some point, some conversations are just not gonna go anywhere. And the thing about politics is when the systems break down, all that's left is hitting people, and that's never good. So ideally, we would find places or ways to work out these differences through the system rather than in other ways, but there is no magical words you can say to someone to get them to just go, yeah, democracy is good. And it's hard work, and that's, that's the part that people don't like as well, is that it's hard and often boring work. Yes, Dr. Harris, and then Peter will come back to you. Tanya, I want to say thank you for a brilliant discussion. Um, I think that you have built on, on uh, uh, Robert's talk and you have taken us to the next level. And so I really want to commend you before our community. I also wanted to uh, get us to recognize that, you know, the, the topic that you were discussing on democratic institutions on a national level obscures how these same undemocratic institutions are happening at state and local levels. Uh, for instance, uh, when I was in government in 2010, one of the things that we did in an omnibus bill to reform the criminal justice system was to ensure that people who were arrested and in prison from downstate did not get counted on the census in small rural jurisdictions. That had previously existed. And what it did is that it bolstered the political representation of smaller upstate rural areas that had prisons so that they had uh, a, a strong representation in terms of political power in the bicameral legislature. So we were able to eliminate that, but what we were not able to do was to uh, ensure that public monies, which were utilizing that same formula, uh, we weren't able to sh shut that down. So we have that type of undemocratic institution operating right now within the state of New York. And as we all know, um, that the issue of criminal justice reform um, when it comes to inv issues involving prisons or law enforcement reform is only the tip of an iceberg. These issues are un invisible uh, until we have someone like you who can make them visible. And so I just wanted to add that point uh, and say yet again, brilliant talk, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, in particular, the locations of prisons is one of those things where you can not only get to this weird uh, sort of not in my backyard politics of I don't want to be near a prison, but also if you could put it in my local uh, state level district, that's great because then we're overrepresented and that's absolutely nationally a thing that happens in a lot of states. Peter G. Yeah, uh, I had kind of another question about we, as you work through um, a couple of different undemocratic institutions, the one that we come back to a lot in conversations is um, the Electoral College. Uh, and kind of as that has been a reoccurring topic of criticism and conversation um, since 
since at least the 2000 election, if not prior. Um, I was wondering if you saw in the next uh, four years with, with new momentum connected to that following multiple elections now that have had um, undemocratic complexities related to the Electoral College, if there was a potential shift in how the Electoral College works, if you saw that as an actual political reality, and if you did, whether you saw that potentially coming through the national popular vote um, interstate compact or actually through Congress, either amending or totally um, rejecting and building a new um, Electoral Count Act, um, replacing the one from 1887. <laughs> So a couple things to work through. I think the interstate compact, which I'll explain for people who might not know in a moment, is probably the easiest way this is done because uh, the electoral college is in the constitution and constitutional amendments are hard. So the interstate compact is a bunch of states who say that if enough states sign on, we will assign all of our electors based to whoever gets the popular national vote to try to link the electoral college more directly to the popular national vote, even though it's not quite the same thing. New York has signed on. I forget how many states we're at at this point. Um, it's the more expedient way. The problem is that there are a lot of states that are overrepresented in the Electoral College currently who do not like the idea of losing that overrepresentation. Uh, that creates important challenges. Uh, same thing with constitutional amendments. If they start in Congress, which they don't have to, but every single one we have has started in Congress, that the states that are advantaged by the system are never going to voluntarily give up on it, which creates a lot of problems there. And the other is with a current partisan advantage to electoral college, it's hard to separate partisan politics from small d democratic politics, as well as the fact that there's not going to be a lot of bipartisan support for getting rid of the electoral college when it comes to strict partisanship. Um, there are other arguments that could be made there and other things that can be done, but it, it's a hard uh, it's a hard road ahead, basically. Uh, what would help it and what would be terrible for the nation would be if you had back-to-back -back presidential elections where you have both parties first one and then the other losing the popular vote but winning the electoral college and that collectively might build the support but that's not the way that it's gone down because if you look at 2016 and 2000 the republicans won both times and it, based on sort of where we have further polarized since then it's it's not likely to build a lot of support so i think it's important i think it should happen it's unlikely it'll be in a constitutional amendment so it'd have to probably be something like the interstate compacts Thank you, Dan. Other questions? Because I, I hate to do because I have a question, but I, as moderator, I hate to jump in and ask questions too. So, so oh, I'll let Tyler ask one first. Okay, so my question is, um, how big of a role does diversity play on the topic of fear? Um, since we are talking about, you know, white democracy and white America, because when we look at um, the new and current administration and cabinet, it is a really diverse cabinet. And when like conserv conservatives or Trump supporters see this, um, it scares the hell out of them because they're starting to realize that because there's more diverse people, they're losing power and people in there don't look like them anymore. Yeah, so there's uh, important representational facts going both ways. So people who are not white are seeing more diversity, more representation are feeling represented. Uh, and similarly, you have people who are used to seeing politicians that look like them who are seeing less of that. Uh, when I mentioned the Electoral College and racial resentment, it turns out that whiter states tend to score higher on racial resentment. So places that have less diversity tend to score higher there. So there's this weird, potentially weird, um, disconnect that happens that places that are less diverse are the ones that have a larger problem with diversity. Now, this could be any number of reasons. It could be that there are other factors that are stopping it from being diverse. It could be um, threats of the unknown uh, or what you're not familiar with. But we also saw a microcosm of this when it came to support for the border wall because most of the border counties and border communities overwhelmingly hated the idea of a border wall. But people that were thousands of miles from the Southern border really liked the idea of a border wall. Uh, which sort of speaks to this uh, disconnect as well. So I think diversity plays a pretty big role, but it's one that is uh, complicated and goes in multiple different directions. 
but I do think that um, increasing diversity is one of the things that um, sparked part of what we saw in 2016. Uh, and it led uh, Tanisha Coates to say that uh, President Trump was the first white president and it was important that he was elected after Barack Obama. Forgot to unmute, sorry. Um, other people, I don't see anybody on Facebook asking questions either. Let me check my other screen for a raised hand, sorry. Nope, nobody there. So, okay, I'm gonna ask mine then. Um, in the beginning of your talk, you put up a quote in, from by Edwards. And I'm wondering if you think that, that his statement actually still fully truly holds um, that there's little attention paid to African-Americans, um, given that it, at least in the media, if not you know, for politicians, this constant recognition, this constant push that, you know, if so-and-so gets the black vote, uh, you know, the white suburban housewife vote, the Latinx vote, um, that's so much more important, you know, that, that will put them over the top, uh, especially when we see these efforts to disenfranchise those specific groups, except for white suburban housewives. I see where you're coming from. Uh, I think it still holds in, in the simple way that if we se separate out electoral politics from actual governance, a lot of the issues that matter most to racial minorities, uh, which are not monolithic by any means, but even in terms of a lot of um, what we are hearing from different pockets uh, within the uh, Black community is issues that are not really being addressed on the national level. Okay. Uh, and I think that sort of captures that's what's happening. Uh, and the Democrats have a pretty nasty history of this, uh, of winning on the back of uh, black and brown votes, but then not delivering policies that actually help those people. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions, comments? Cynthia. Mm. What do you think about like the gun laws or like when people obtain, people are obtaining guns because of the, after the riot, um, because people are like fearing for their lives, thinking that it could be like another civil war or something like that. Like, what do you think of it personally? Cause like for me, morally, I don't believe in guns, um, but I mean, I can see their side of, you know, in a way, but what do you think about it? I think it's important that we uh, separate out those who would be stockpiling weapons because they think a civil war is imminent and they want to participate in it, uh, and those who might be experiencing fear at social upheaval or change and that want to do something to try to address that fear, because I think those are different uh, motivating impulses. Mm -hmm. uh, and sadly, we're seeing both play out um, in part because we have we have a media that it sensationalizes and plays up fear in a lot of different ways. So I think that speaks to part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have readily access to, uh, to guns and many people report that guns make them feel safe. So whatever is in that, it's one thing to try to address it that way. It's another to say, we need a revolution. We need to overthrow the government or any of the things that some of the pockets that led to the protests on the 6th we're calling for. We have entire movements that are built around the idea of the coming civil war that is not being treated as something to fear, but something to celebrate. Um, I think the country has a problem with the latter and needs to monitor and take seriously uh, those groups. Uh, and the former is a much more complicated political question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Mark Polupchuk. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Professor, for an outstanding talk. Um, this has been really um, interesting. Uh, first, a uh, an observation and then a question for you. So um, I live here in Washington, D.C., and I think it was about um, a couple weeks before the election, one of these Trump trains was going around the, the Beltway. My wife and I were driving. It was probably, I, I guess it was 10 or 12 miles long. Um, people driving slowly, waving flags, and so on. And um, as we were coming back from where we were going, this train was still going around the beltway. And I had to pull my car over the side of the road because I saw a guy standing in the back of a truck with his Trump flags. 
saluting all the people coming by him in the Trump trains, except he was throwing the Nazi salute. And I couldn't believe my eyes in the United States of America, 20 miles from DC in 2020, somebody would do that in public. And it, it just floored me. Like it, it was, it, I just found it, my wife and I were so appalled, we, could, we couldn't imagine this. So there's, I, there's, you know, my observation is that some folks there, something has gone wrong where, you know, in 1960, I'm not sure you'd have gotten very far throwing a Nazi salute, even in DC, you know, which is, a, you know, it's just not going to happen. Uh, question is, what do political scientists think about the, demo, uh, uh, the solution or a solution to the problem being the demographic trends in the United States. The, the, you know, the country is becoming more racially diverse. Uh, it's becoming more black and more brown, people from different places. Um, is that a potential solution that will help address some of these undemographic, undemocratic institutions? Perhaps because some of the solutions you offered me, I didn't, there wasn't a lot of, I didn't have a lot of hope, you know, from what you, what you described here. So is, are demographics part of the answer? Demographics could be part of the answer. Uh, part of the problem is where people live. Um, I have seen, I don't know how serious some of these are, um, but some calls for funds to relocate people to better geographically disperse people based on resources, uh, but also based on politics to move people from safe blue areas to competitive red areas or from safe red areas to competitive blue areas uh, to better intermix and change these things. I don't know how anyone would ever go about it or what funds would be needed there. And I question anything that's based on just intentionally moving people for those reasons. Uh, but demographics can get us so far. But uh, the problem is the lack of geographic disbursement in Americans in general, but in particular um, racial minorities. They're just not, one, not spread out equally across the country, and two, when they are, then that further dilutes voting power. So we get these really sort of uh, competing interests there. So demographics are possibly part of it, but we're also seeing a lot of backlash to demographics, and we've seen it before. Any of the uh, points in history where we've targeted immigration, we've talked about the fighting back on uh, reconstruction, that shifting demographics and shifting power dynamics oftentimes anger groups that are used to being in power, uh, who see the changes, even if they are more small d democratic, as threatening their position in society. So status politics suddenly becomes uh, part of it as well. So demographics can help, but they're also likely to create more issues before they help. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just in order of hands raised, Peter G. and then Stacy. Yeah, I actually had a follow up to Mr. Uh, Polipchuk's uh, question about um, kind of that experience that he shared about seeing the the Trump wagon and 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 the Nazi salute. Um, we it appears at least uh, in from from following media and following news that there's been a rise in at least the the outspokenness of neo-Nazi and anti-Semitism and uh, white supremacist uh, like political ideologies, and they've been more folded into the mainstream. Is that they're just being covered more, um, or um, are they coming out in public more, or has there actually been an uptick in people prescribing to such uh, bigoted um, ideology? Yeah, to some to some extent, that's a impossible to answer question with the empirics we have, uh, because if if these people were around but not telling anyone that they were around, uh, and now they are, uh, it, it's hard to say. Um, but we've seen a rise in other countries. We've seen the rise here. Uh, but the uh, Anti Defamation League and the Southern Poverty Law Center both have uh, chronicled an uptick in in events of both. So I'm. <sighs> If I had to guess, I would say, based on the uptick, we're seeing more people acting on these views, but these views in different ways have existed in America different, for a long time. Um, I mean, Hitler positively cited US policies on more than one occasion uh, for influencing various other aspects. Uh, 
Long Island had pro-Nazi marches uh, in the lead up to World War II. You've got the Skokie, Illinois. Skokie? Is it Skokie? Yeah. Um, the Nazis marching in the 60s in Illinois through a predominantly Jewish town. Um, so these things have always sort of been on the fringes. What I think we've seen is decades of de-mainstreaming, if that's a, a thing, uh, of making it harder for people to be seen as acceptable and expressing these, these thoughts and opinions, and a recent upsurge in, for whatever reason, uh, this thought or acceptance of all the expression of these ideas publicly. So there's probably more of it, especially as more of it comes back, but I do think part of it also is people who held these views who now feel emboldened to share them publicly. Okay, so we have Stacy. Um, I think Dr. Harris had his hand up, or did you put it back down? Yes, you had it up. And then Dr. DeSimone and Shelby chatted. Mm -hmm. so. Wonderful, thank you for all the, the facts and the statistics, it was enjoyable. Um, over over time, it, it appears that revolution and rebellion and and all of that, it's in the DNA of uh, American, uh, the American history of democracy. And we are the unusual animal in the world that is trying this great experiment. And this experiment is so important that it, it would appear that anyone involved would do their very best to preserve uh, that constant movement toward strengthening democracy. What I can't understand is how someone can be part of a democracy and appear at every angle to, to sort of tear it down or challenge it. Um, and what I can say about the last four years with the Trump administration and, and that presidency was that it did challenge the checks and balances. It put all the democratic institutions on alert and they literally had to fend for themselves but I can't understand, and if you can help me with this, and here is my question, um, what is it or should there be uh, an aspect of party responsibility, whether you're Republican or Democratic, to preserve the democracy so that if you sense a party or a president or a governor or whomever, starting to veer away from the values of democracy, the values of, of every vote should count, the values of a, a peaceful transition and all of these things. Isn't there something in, that can engage that, that person, that president into uh, nudging that individual back into the, the right frame of mind or giving uh, a, a sense of perspective to that person or to the followers of that person. And then I guess one of the questions is, well, what's, you know, what's right? And, and to, to what perspective is right? You know, who is to say that A is right and B is wrong? But just in the strengthening of democracy, it really appears that there were no guide rails um, in the last four years. What, what do you say about that? There just seems to be, um, the, the brakes were off and we just mm -hmm. sort of free spun into chaos. One of the things that became abundantly clear is, over the last four years is how much of things that we took for granted were unwritten rules. And as unwritten rules go, they're only rules if they're followed. Uh, so the part of what we saw in, in a variety of different institutions is that a lot of those norms and unwritten rules broke down because there was no one there to enforce them, which goes to your, your sort of primary question is, in a democratic society, it's all of our responsibilities to enforce them, be it uh, through elections in terms of not voting for people who undermine democracy, um, but in a more meaningful way, any sort of criticism or response or nudges back to democracy are gonna be more effective when they come from people who generally agree with you. Uh, the same thing like uh, last week we had the, or not last week, well, uh, last talk, uh, we had this discussion about, you know, mask and, and saying things, or you can think about any other context, um, when you can play on interpersonal relationships that you have, either shared party, uh, an existing relationship, familial connections, whatever the case may be, you always have more to build on to try to 
point out ways in which people are doing things that are detrimental to other people, that are detrimental to themselves, they're detrimental to society, any which way you want to frame it. So in terms of trying to reorient ourselves towards these democratic values, these uh, promises that we've laid down in the Declaration and the Constitution, it, it needs to come from all of us, but it will always be most meaningful when it comes from people that have that connection to play on. So be it partisans, uh, be it personal friends, whatever the case may be. So again, we all have a role to play, even if we only start locally or in our own communities, to call out the things we see, to remind people, and importantly, catch ourselves, and don't fight people when they call us out for when we have these slip ups, because depending on what we're talking about, there are going to be these moments where all of us are going to find ourselves on both sides of these issues. And it's important that we try to remain open. So we're all responsible, uh, which isn't a great answer, but ideally those closest to those who are most responsible would be the ones who rein them in. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe it was Drs. Harris and then DeSimone. And then yes, uh, thank you, um, Dr. Whitner. I'd like to go back to the question that Mr. Pilchuk, is that, did I pronounce your name correctly, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. I'd like to go back to the question that he raised, Daniel, because I think it is a really very important one. As he raised that question, what fired off in my mind is the intersectionality between the mobility of capital, technology, how both have influenced migration and immigration, and how uh, the decennial census affects the uh, development of undemocratic institutions with um, the apportionment. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that because we can't really understand migratory movement without understanding the power that capital has on people's ability to move. And I'm just thinking about the great migration. Um, the effect that the Great Migration had at the end of the 19th century, and certainly during the period of World War I, where it pulled uh, Black people into the urban North, uh, and it boosted the GDP of those particular states while having conversely a very damaging impact when it came to the loss of labor from Southern states. So I'm wondering if we could push further into Mr. Pilchuk's question, looking at that intersectionality. Yeah, um, for those who've never had to do it, interstate moves are expensive and they're hard. Uh, and if you don't have, I mean, let's just start there, like the, the capital to make the move, uh, to have connections, to have a job when you get there, um, it, it's definitely gonna limit your chances and what you could possibly do. So we already have like those connections, um, potential problems on a very small personal level there, but on a much greater one, Capital both allows for migration. Uh, it could be what draws people in. And now that we're in a huge economic downturn and, and a pandemic, mobility is particularly difficult and the economy is suffering. So people are getting stuck in these areas, which is going to make it harder. We already have a huge racial wealth gap that uh, for most Americans, especially white Americans, uh, most of our wealth is tied up in our homes. Uh, when you have a history of housing discrimination, we have these other problems. Uh, but to even speak across a couple of these questions, we also see things like redlining, uh, which was much more common in the North with things like the Great Migration and then other waves of migration as well that lead to segregation in areas. And there's interesting ways where even when segregation happens in housing in the South, that white and black communities are more interspersed in a lot of Southern states than they are in Northern ones where you have intentional segregation in addition to development. So capital in a different way that can not only push white families into one area and black families into another, which then leads to school funding issues that perpetuates these same sort of inequalities. So it's really hard to talk about any of this without wrestling with this really important question of where is the financial power and where are the resources and what's being used to help what people add in another complicating factor, which is both FDR's own sort of entrenched racial beliefs 
in the New Deal, as well as a Southern Senate, even with the, within the Democratic Party, that intentionally wanted to exclude African Americans from New Deal party um, programs, that you have these competing factors that through these undemocratic institutions and um, talk about economic uh, discrimination, employment discrimination, education discrimination, that it's almost too much to try to unpack in anything resembling, a, a, I think, a thorough answer. But it does need to be brought up that that's always going to be part of it as well. And then when we look at where different communities live, you also have the um, waves of immigration that then come with. It's easier to find economic sustainability in communities of people who look or share some sort of connection with you. So we get things like Chinatowns showing up in a bunch of cities. Um, Utica itself had its you know, Italian neighborhood and then its Latinx neighborhood. And all of this is, is very much related and it complicates basically everything and pervades everything we're saying. So it's much more than just those big institutions. And if we don't acknowledge that capital and these other racial systems are intersecting. We're missing so much of the story. Thank you. Uh, Peter D. Simone. Yeah, it might be a little bit off topic now, but I was just going to add on to what Dan had already touched on in response to the questions of the seemingly over coverage of right wing extremism. Uh, Dan did it, did touch on the end, but it's, it's not just an American thing, it's a global. Uh, thing and that numbers of both participants as an active members as well as exposure has increased and that's actually gonna be something I'll be talking about next week is that it's a particularly in places like Germany today and Eastern Europe uh, right-wing extremism is actually quite popular uh, in fact there are effectively quasi-fascist governments in power uh, as we speak uh, at this point uh, so that's something to you know, so I just wanted to more add on to that. I, um, but Dan, you know, did a good job covering it, and I thought you know, to get us as a comment did a very good job of tying into this question of you know that Robert raised, uh, you know, how do we address these things? Uh, but yeah, you answered a lot of the other things I was going to bring as well too. Well done. Okay, so Shelby's question yeah. um, says says uh, almost every presidential election that I can remember, I hear the words voter fraud being tossed around. Those in opposition claim that voter fraud exists and happens in a recent presidential election. Dr. Tagliarina, what are your thoughts on voter fraud and its impact on faith, our faith in democracy? Yeah, so what we know is that political scientists have been studying claims of fraud for a long time and overwhelmingly and without fail, actual voter fraud is almost non-existent cases of intentional fraud or any of these other things, it's just they don't happen. Uh, the few cases that seem like cases are usually like someone with a problem with their ID or someone voting in the place they thought they were allowed to vote, not voting twice, but voting in the wrong location through an honest mistake. So there are some of these things, but part of what we've seen, including with um, certain uh, political operatives putting out I'll call them bounties, uh, for information on voter fraud is that it's not coming forward because it's not really an issue. And when it happens, you're talking about the small number of cases, like four at most, um, <laughs> including a couple high profile cases of people committing voter fraud to prove that voter fraud is happening only to be caught committing voter fraud and to get busted for the fraud committed in the sake of proving that fraud happens, which undermines the whole point because they were caught, which means really we're pretty darn good at catching it, um, which creates these other issues. But the, the thing that political scientists can say with a whole lot of certainty is that fraud in our elections is not a real issue. There are plenty of other issues, uh, including not trusting election results. And we saw some of that data and that is a completely separate issue. Uh, one of the things I didn't share, but was really fascinating is in polling people after the election, belief or support for media, any media drastically decreased people's likelihood to believe that voter fraud happened. And this inc includes people who said that uh, Fox News, you know, sort of the quintessential right-wing uh, news source, 
is their main news source or their most trusted one, even they believed le less often than the average person that voter fraud happened. Uh, the most significant factor leading to belief in fraud in this last election was claiming that the uh, President Trump was your main source of news. So, scary. yes, uh, scary which also <laughs> means trust in media. Uh, and I'm one slipped. of the things that's also been found is that um, when you don't trust media, you're more likely to fall for conspiracy theories or other fraud. Uh, of not, you're more likely to be scammed in many ways if you don't believe the media is accurate, which is, I don't know what we do with that, but we got to rebuild trust, I think, uh, in our uh, sort of news sources and in a lot of ways. And most of them are far more down the middle than we like to think they are. Thank you. I was going to give Peter the last question, but we've got another one after him. And I was actually going to steal the last question, but I can't rob Emmeline of her. So Peter. Um, thank you. Uh, so Dr. Harris mentioned capital, which Dr. Tagliarina knows is a bit of a buzzword that sets off sirens in my head. So it made me think of something um, along the lines of the linking, linking capital and um, means to um, electoral reform. Uh, the idea essentially being that we've seen consistently that those with more capital often have mechanisms for influencing elections. Um, but moreover, we've also found that that influence on elections has sometimes led to people, quote unquote, voting against their interests or, or splintering of, of groups. Um, so the, the kind of the undemocratic or inequitable distribution of capital has equated to some gaps or some splintering amongst the electorate that, uh, it, from my perspective in, in where I study in political science, would be like the splintering of a working class against its own interests. So would potential economic reform, which could be framed um, outside of maybe partisan issues and instead kind of more framed in benefiting one's own constituents, regardless of party, be a mechanism for democratic reform that doesn't require the same political capital as like changing the electoral college? That is a great question. I unfortunately don't have a great answer. <laughs> um, I, I think it's important that we think about that though. Uh, it would be interesting and it's a, too far beyond the, the realm of knowledge that I have to really sort of sort of speculate as to how that one would play out. Uh, but it would be interesting to address that. And I will also say though, that some of those arguments about people voting against their economic interests, whether true or not, are also um, wrapped up in pretty gross levels of paternalism uh, where a lot of the people um, who make those arguments are deciding they know better than what voters want or need or what's actually in their interest. And they discount a lot of other cultural and social factors that influence people to vote. So there's some problem with some of those arguments about people voting against their economic interest or they just privilege uh, economics above everything else, which isn't actually a thing that people do. And we have study data on that. As to the effect of uh, important economic reforms, I, I simply don't know but I think it's a great question to think about. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so Emmeline's question, and I'm gonna piggyback on it because it's um, similar uh, with what I was gonna ask. And then unless there's anybody else, that's that will be it. Because I think we've worn <laughs> Dr. Tagliarina out for the evening. But question is regarding Shelby's question. I've seen some posts on social media about Trump uh, votes being in the trash. A few people said that it was fake news. Some people couldn't vote in person. Instead, they were some were able to have an absentee ballot. Is it possible that some absentee ballots were not counted in the election? And my tag on to that is, I seem to re. I've maybe it's the eternal pessimist in me, but the idea that you know with this constant cries of voter fraud are a way to disenfranchise people who are going to vote in a way you think they're going to vote, as in against you. Um, and so I don't know if, am I just going into like the, uh, liberal conspiracy theory or is, are we, am I maybe thinking something? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, any of votes or attempts to limit how people vote or when people vote or, uh, is definitely making certain assumptions about what sort of people are going to vote for what sort of candidates or where they're coming from. So 
there's something to that. Uh, as to the, the specific question, yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen these complaints. Uh, they were at the heart of some of Trump's legal challenges in courts, almost all of which, which were roundly um, thrown out. And any of the ones that brought up these uh, sometimes with uh, pretty negative responses from the judges that were asked to hear this because there's simply no reliable evidence and in fact um, contradictory or played out um, factually inaccurate statements made uh, about some of these things. Now, were some absentee ballots not counted? Absolutely. Like we, we know this because there's a certain number of absentee ballots that will be thrown out uh, for not following whatever the, the procedures are. So different states have different procedures. Uh, so if you don't follow specifically, um, like some of them require you to sign the outside of the envelope, some of you require to do other things. Uh, and election laws in states require that ballots that are not properly cast not be counted. So we know that some of them didn't count. As to being valid ones thrown in the trash, there's no evidence of that. Um, and the judges that were specifically asked to rule on that have said as much. Thank you very much. Oops, we got, oh, we have some thank yous. Um, oh, and okay. So th that being said, I would like to once again, thank Dr. Tagliarina for a fascinating talk um, and a marathon question and answer session. So thank you very much. And I'd like to have, invite everyone to join us again uh, next Wednesday night uh, when Dr. Clem Harris, also from Utica College, will be giving a talk called Race and Reform in the Early Progressive Era, How the South's Lost Cause Triumphed in the Urban North, which promises to be as fascinating as all these other, as the other talks we've heard so far. And uh, so thank you all for it coming and we hope to see you all next week. Uh, and don't forget the semester's coming. Thank have you for great, everyone. <laughs> have a great night. Thank you, Dan.